I want to start by uh, uh, following on some of the things that the governor said, and I must say, uh, I was mighty, mightily impressed by what he said. I tend to agree uh, with what he said, and I know, at least in the circles I travel in, not everybody does agree, but uh, I do think that uh, what we're headed for in the United States is a system um, in the interest of all our children, in the interest both of equity and efficiency in our education system that does align uh, secondary, post-secondary, and uh, labor markets. Uh, I think that what I heard today, which is striking to me because I don't hear it very often at all, especially from elected officials, is the notion that there needs to be career pathways that are anchored uh, in secondary schools that provide bridges to post-secondary education. That is not a, uh, a common notion uh, among people in higher education or in public policy either. Uh, there is a great fear of tracking in the United States, which has pretty much kept us from building a secondary education system that serves uh, the broad mass of American youth uh, we have essentially built, especially since 1983, uh, with the uh, Nation at Risk report, for those of you who remember that, uh, which was the report that triggered this generation of education reform that first moved through elementary education and then to secondary education. And once it hit secondary, um, it uh, began to look toward post-secondary and has finally arrived. Uh, but in all that, there was a general dismissal of what the governor, I think, somewhat stubbornly calls vocational education uh, because uh, it had such a bad name uh, after 1983, that is vocational education, that it had to leave town and get a new name. Uh, its new name is career and technical education. I admire his willingness to use real words in these conversations. Uh, so I think the, uh, that is the element I hear in his program that strikes me as most hopeful. Uh, because we know that since 1983 in the United States, uh, while it was a very good thing for all of us to agree that every American young person ought to get a K-12 education uh, that was uh, virtually entirely academic, and that we should shut down uh, the old lines of education which were uh, discriminatory with respect to women and blue collar males, uh, which is to say the old high school education system uh, was one in which uh, maybe 5%, and that was the target uh, in the 1950s after World War II, that 5% of the kids would go on to college. Uh, James Conant and a whole series of other uh, uh, very powerful uh, people uh, decided that we needed to have a cadre to lead America as a world power uh, in the military, in science, in business, and so on. And that would require about 5% of the high school graduates to go on to college. Their view was there weren't many more qualified to do that anyway. Uh, and so we built a system uh, the comprehensive high school it's called in the education literature I learned. I'm not an education scholar, but I, I'm around them a bit. Uh, the comprehensive high school that it displaced presumed that there were at least three tracks, and in truth there were four. Uh, one was that 5% uh, who were bound to college. Uh, and then the second track was one for uh, males uh, to get vocational training in blue collar occupations which were available and well paid uh, when they made that decision in their defense. Uh, and then a track for women which was essentially home economics. There was a general presumption uh, that women uh, were not suited either for vocational training or for academic training beyond high school. And then there was another track which had various names, which was sort of a very dumbed down track uh, for the most disadvantaged kids uh, that provided them with a bare minimum education, again in a world where that's all that was required in many cases in order to make a middle class earning. In 83 we jettisoned that, quite rightly, uh, 
uh, both for equity reasons, for fairness reasons, and because uh, the economy demanded we do so, we were underproducing talent in the United States uh, uh, at massive uh, levels. It's back in the day when um, I used to work at ETS, and it's when the purpose of the SAT, you can read in the documents from those times, was to find um, to find uh, Einstein behind a plow, as we used to say at ETS, that somewhere out here was the imagery. Uh, I think it was always some tall, rugged, uh, white, blonde kid with blue eyes, frankly. Uh, but that there was somebody out here in Indiana behind a plow with a sixth grade education who was the next Einstein, and we needed a national test to find him. Well, that test has evolved uh, mightily since then. It's now basically a transitional device for a large mass of Americans to go to college. And so we built uh, that system until 83 when it became very apparent that we were underproducing skill. Uh, people had tied that to our economic woes at the time, which were in many ways worse than the ones we have now. Uh, and people tied that to uh, our presence in the world uh, and our national security because we lost our economic power, all of our other powers would follow uh, and we'd lose them too and be uh, defenseless in an economy, a global economy where the economic power had shifted elsewhere. And so after 83, we decided to teach everybody Algebra II uh, and we've been doing that ever since. It has been, I would argue, and this is not a uh, something everybody agrees with, I think it's been too much of a good thing. Um, Algebra 2, uh, which is essentially where K-12 education reform has crashed into the boulders off the shore, uh, pushing everybody through Algebra 2 and through high level, uh, very abstract curriculums uh, that teach almost every subject from uh, very elementary ideas, think of math as you took it, and I've taken a lot of math. Uh, it starts out with very simple ideas that are abstract, uh, although you can count apples and add and subtract them, but pretty soon you're dealing with things you can't put your hands on, uh, and the abstraction increases and increases and increases. Um, and that we know that one, uh, not many people learn well in those kinds of curriculums, uh, fact is, what we knew at ETS and always puzzled us was when we tested young Americans and gave them mathematical operations to perform, they did marvelously well. They'd all memorized uh, the chapters and done the questions at the back of the chapter. If we gave them a problem to solve that required that they select out a mathematical operation to help solve the problem, uh, where the math was one among many tools to get the answer, they failed miserably. So they knew a lot of math, but didn't understand what they knew. Uh, they were learning it in very abstract environments. They didn't know why most of the time, and couldn't tell you why you might take geometry before calculus. Uh, so there is a, uh, I think, and I think that bias in American education continues. Uh, I think the common core uh, may reinforce that bias. So when I hear a governor say that he's interested in uh, an alternative kind of pedagogy uh, at the secondary level and a pedagogy that le then leads on uh, to post-secondary education and training, which to me resolves the political issue of tracking, that is so long as what you get in high school can move you to college, uh, in the American mind, that's fair enough. Uh, because we don't mind tracking people once they're out of high school. Because getting to college or post-secondary education and training, as it is now more properly called, uh, is really the object of uh, K-12 education in educational terms and, uh, and from my narrow perch on this issue in economic terms uh, as well. So uh, I applaud the governor. I've not heard anybody put it together that clearly, frankly. Uh, either in a state or nationally. Uh, a couple other points I want to make. Uh, uh, th one of the things that, the issue that rises here almost immediately with most people is uh, why is this necessary? 
Uh, why is it that we have to load up uh, young people with so much education in order that they succeed uh, in a modern economy? Uh, why is it necessary to attach uh, higher education, college education, what we tend to think of as four-year uh, selective college education in our minds, uh, a system that modern education reform since 1983 essentially presumes that people go through K-12, take three years of language, four years of math, four years of science, whatever, uh, 12 AP courses and on and on and on and on uh, so that they can go to a selective four-year college. Uh, there's those who, there are those who make that standard and those who don't. Uh, and the standard is apparently not accidental uh, by class, race, ethnicity, or gender, uh, which is one of its problems. So in the end, uh, what we built is a system that takes us from high school to Harvard, uh, and things are a lot more complicated than that. And to the extent that we can build an alternative pedagogy and pathway uh, for people to do the same learning, uh, to graduate from high school in greater numbers, uh, to move on to post-secondary education, to get the basics in math uh, and reading and other subject areas that will serve them well, uh, as citizens and as workers in the United States, uh, I think we're all comfortable with that. And unless we build an alternative pathway out of high school, I think we're uh, condemning a lot of our students. Uh, there'll be those who'll take the high road, uh, and most of those are advantaged in some way or other. Uh, and then there'll be those who pursue the muddy middle path uh, which is to say they'll go on to college uh, in very large numbers, fewer of them will ever complete, uh, and for the most part they'll get lower returns from their college experience. We now live in a country where uh, 39 to 40 million people uh, have some college and no certificate and no degree. We're missing all the middle rungs in the American education system. It's high school and Harvard or good luck. Uh, so I think, uh, to some extent, uh, this is at least, uh, maybe it's not the answer, uh, but it's what's up next. It's what we know how to try to do. And in the American case, we reach for these alternatives in higher education because we've got nobody else to go to. If we were Germans, uh, we could reach for apprenticeship. Uh, if we were uh, British, we could move our people through very rigid hierarchies of post-secondary institutions that essentially uh, divide by class and do not really divide so much by ability or uh, preparation. But in the United States, when we discovered, and we didn't discover it until the late 80s, uh, that we were underperforming in higher education, that is, uh, not only had we uh, not produce sufficient talent out of high school and on to college, uh, but that uh, problem grew enormously uh, after 1983. Started showing up uh, in the 70s. You know, it's notable that the Nation at Risk report occurred in 1983 because for most economists, uh, that's when the, uh, the gap between what we were producing and what we needed in economic terms began to accelerate at an accelerating rate. Uh, but it raises, one of the questions that always comes to people like me is, well, why did this happen? How did this happen? And let me give you a brief thumbnail sketch of, I think, looking retrospectively, uh, what we know about why this happened. And I think we're pretty clear about why all this happened. Uh, if you look at 1973, which was the last year of the American post-war boom, uh, we were the dominant economic and military and cultural and uh, any other kind of measure you want to use uh, power in the world between 46 and 73. Huge pent-up demand from the Great Depression, shift from war production in World War II to uh, consumer production in the economy. A lot of money floating around in the United States and we were the only nation that wasn't digging out from the rubble. Uh, in fact, we'd made a lot of money in World War II supplying the other combatants. So we came out of World War II ready to go, uh, and we did. Uh, 
uh, we dominated uh, the global economy in ways that no one has ever seen before or I suspect will ever see again because the other players weren't playing. So in the end, uh, our dominance came from one single competitive requirement, and that was that we made more and more stuff, more standardized goods and services at lower and lower and lower prices. High efficiency, mass production, uh, big pens, uh, anything that uh, could be run off an assembly line reproduced as fast as possible. Uh, we learned how to do that best in our war production plants. And then when it came to switching over back, switching back in many cases in the auto industry, back to cars, we were ready to go. Uh, and in between 46 and 73, we were dominant. In 73, we started falling off. The rest of the world started producing and competing with us. And in 73, uh, if you think of Indiana, which is a classic case of, uh, in this story, uh, if you think in terms of Indiana and the nation, in 1973, about 70% of the workers had high school or less. 40% didn't have high school degrees, people who were working in the American economy. And they didn't need them. In 1973, 70% of the people who were working had high school or less. Uh, and more than half of them, about 65% of those with high school or less, uh, were earning middle class wages. And that was, in current dollars, that would be somewhere between $35,000 to $40,000 today a year uh, on up. Most of them concentrated in current dollars between thirty-five dollars or $40,000 and about $85,000 uh, in those days. In fact, in, after 73, it still was the case all the way through the 70s that the value of college education was declining relative to the value of blue-collar jobs. It fell down, uh, was down near 39%, depending on whose number you use. Some people get a little over 40, uh, but we had about 40% wage premium for college degrees. Um, that is, people with college degrees made more than, uh, made 40% more than people with high school or less. And then we had the 80-81 recession. Uh, for those of you who might remember, we went through the 70s were a terrible period in American economic history. We had very high inflation, 12 and 13% inflation, uh, and we also had very low productivity. Uh, that is, our ability to make standardized goods and services cheaper and cheaper was failing. And then on top of that, we had a huge quality problem. Our defect rates were higher than our competitors. They caught up and surpassed us uh, on quality. Big story in those days were how many uh, uh, computer chips early in the early manufacturing of those, uh, or how many cars you got out without uh, uh, having major difficulty with a car. For those of you who remember, in those days you bought a car, a new car, and they told you not to drive it fast. I think it was for a thousand miles. If you drove it fast, it might fall apart. I'm not sure. I'll look around the room. Some of you will remember this. And then after you drove it, I think, a thousand miles, you would bring it back to the dealer and they would go in with a wrench and tighten it up. It was a pretty ramshackle device. Uh, quality was low. Volkswagens, you didn't have to do that with. The Volkswagen Beetle, which was the first car that was bought here, a lot cheaper than ours as well. But in any, it was simpler uh, and more well made. So there is a, uh, a period in the 70s when things looked pretty bad and it looked as if we were going to lose our manufacturing advantages. In fact, manufacturing employment peaked in 1979, kept growing. But the rest of the world uh, kept growing along behind us at a fairly rapid rate, and they were consuming more manufactured goods. Uh, Volkswagen was selling a lot of cars, in spite of the fact that uh, we were selling more and more American cars. Uh, and then, uh, uh, in addition to quality, uh, we began to have other problems. That is, we couldn't make uh, 
sufficient variety in our production systems. Uh, we couldn't make enough models of different cars and uh, from time to time we uh, didn't have sufficient sensitivity to markets to produce a car that anybody wanted, the Edsel. Uh, so in the end, uh, 73 to 80 was pretty bad and then we had 13 percent inflation. Uh, the government decided, that is the Carter administration decided uh, that the only way out of this was to cause a recession and so we did. The recession, the inflation was so bad that the only way to stop it was to take money out of people's pockets. The only way to take money out of people's pockets so they couldn't bid up the prices of everything. Uh, and their wages would stop rising at 9 or 10% a year uh, was to get them fired. So the Federal Reserve Board slammed on the brakes and we had the 80-81 recession, which was the deepest recession since the Great Depression until the last one. But in truth, the unemployment rate in the 80-81 recession actually went higher than the unemployment rate in this last recession, although it was for a much briefer period of time. Uh, after 83, there was a fear that, uh, one, we knew that industry would start to restructure because we were no longer competitive in manufacturing and we knew uh, that manufacturing companies and others would have to lay off a lot of workers because they couldn't afford to pay wages in real dollars anymore. In those days, uh, if you gave your workers four or five percent uh, wage increase a year with a union contract, if inflation was 10, well, you made a nickel. When inflation goes down below 5 cents, when you give a 6, uh, a 5 percent, you give a 6 percent raise, that's real money. So layoffs were necessary, massive layoffs. I remember one company that I knew well in those days, General Electric, uh, that uh, they decided on one single day when they did their books, they had to lay off 30 percent of their workforce and they had to do it within nine months. And they did. So we began to move to a whole different model. The great fear among economists was that that model, that industry base wouldn't have sufficient productivity to demand, would, to produce enough wages so that you could afford skilled workers anyway. The phrases in those days uh, were that we were about to become, when manufacturing went down, we were going to become a nation of hamburger flippers, McDonald's. Uh, we were going to have to earn our living by taking in each other's wash. Uh, we were going to be in a service economy with low productivity, therefore low wages and certainly low skill requirements. Nobody saw where the demand for post-secondary education and training in the economy would come from. Uh, how can you have a service economy that's highly productive, since services are inherently uh, not productive, because they're very labor intensive. It's hard to do services with machines. So nobody could figure out how you were gonna do uh, very high quality, uh, high volume uh, services at low cost uh, with machinery, a problem we still face in healthcare and education. The only two industries left in America where productivity is actually negative. And so, um, but it turned out that that was all, um, that was all untrue. Uh, in 1983, the economy began to restructure, began shedding uh, manufacturing, transportation, utilities, uh, jobs very, very fast, as well as jobs in mining and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the memory that a lot of us have, probably a memory that's deeply embedded in this state, is of a crash uh, after 1983, after a very bad decade in the 70s. Uh, so a lot of people lived through 20 years of bad times, especially if they worked in manufacturing. So there was a, uh, that's when a lot of these little industrial towns began to go, uh, began to go south. Uh, so I, you know, they're in several respects. Uh, so in the end, uh, but what did happen after 83 that nobody saw coming was the value of college education started to go up. And it was college educated workers not working in manufacturing, they were all working in service industries. Uh, 
So we were getting enough value out of service industries to pay higher and higher wages, not as high as a union job in manufacturing, but higher and higher wages, uh, and more and more skill was required. And so we had then uh, a, a huge U-turn in the American economy that nobody saw coming. The books that were written in the 70s going into the 80s, one of the most famous among economists, because this was done by a very famous economist who is otherwise spotless on his record, uh, was called The Undereducated American. Uh, excuse me, The Overeducated American. There was a great fear in the uh, late 70s after all this was going on for a while that we had a rambunctious younger generation that was anti-war, uh, anti-middle class culture, anti just about everything, uh, pro-drugs and sexual freedom on American campuses, and we were about to set them loose in the world and we had no jobs for them. So people said, we're in trouble. Uh, we've got a revolution of rising expectations. Uh, these folks are troublemakers, they're gonna hit the labor market, we have no jobs for them, uh, there's gonna be more trouble than we've seen before. Now they're gonna attack capitalism. They already had, actually. So in the end, uh, what happened after 83 was a nice surprise. Uh, the economy began to hire college-educated workers, pay them more, and the, the, the long and the short of it is since 1983, you go 83 to 2002, uh, the wage premium for college, which had fallen below 40%, went up to 84%. That is, college-educated workers on average, a lot of people in that average, college-educated workers on average were earning 84% more than high school-educated workers. You saw a boom in the 70s in community colleges to meet rising demand, and the post-secondary education system came into being, really, with construction in the 70s. Uh, the development of the community college and the building of a whole middle tier of jobs that were AA eventually certificate, eventually industry-based certifications like Microsoft certifications. We began to fill in the middle. And so the reason why this pressure falls on American higher education or post-secondary education and training, because a lot of it is training, it's not education. When you go to a community college and learn to become a flag waver on a construction site, educators will refuse to call that education. Economists think it's education, but educators are pretty clear it's not. So in the end, we built a post-secondary education and training system, uh, and it paid off enormously. And we uh, saw that trend rise till 82, 2002, flattened out and bumped around after 2002. Then we hit this recession. Uh, the earnings return to post-secondary fell from 84% to 74% now. It's still very high. In most uh, parts of the world, let's say Europe by comparison. A post-secondary education has about 40% more value than what we call a high school education. In the United States, it's up in the 70s and 80s. We value it more. It determines more, uh, in, in the United States, it has more value than it does in Europe. Because in Europe, the government provides a lot of the things you need from a job. Health care, vacations, minimum earning standards, child care. In the United States, you have to get all that stuff with a job, pretty much. And we're reluctant to have the government get more and more involved in providing that stuff. But we're very comfortable that education determines whether or not you get that stuff. If you get a better education, you get a better job, you buy your own uh, health care, you, you get it from your employer. Uh, you buy your own child care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You figure out your own vacation, all the rest of it. So in America, the marginal value of education is actually higher than in the rest of the world because more and more what you get in the economy is determined by uh, going, your schooling. So we built a system that has a very powerful reliance on post-secondary. So people then say, why is it then that employers are simply hiring more degrees? Uh, they're just buying degrees. That's not true. Keep in mind, 
that in the 1970s, the value of college degrees went down. Employers aren't stupid. They'll get what they need at the lowest possible price. That's the nature of an economic institution and a market economy. So in after 83, when they started paying more and more and more, chasing post-secondary skill more and more and more, and throwing more and more money at it, tells you they valued it. Your boss is not Santa Claus. So in the end, the uh, system, uh, the common explanation for all this, uh, there are two. Uh, one is the economist explanation, which is that technology did it. Um, economists are wont to say that, and long-term technology really is the culprit most of the time. In this case, what happened was uh, computer-based technology came to the fore after 83. Uh, it had profound effects on the way work was done, both in service sectors and in uh, the industrial sector. Uh, and what it did in a very aggressive way was the, the technology, the computer, oftentimes hooked up to other technology, automated anything that was repetitive in a job. And then not shortly after uh, 85, we began to see it automating not only individual tasks in jobs, but sets of tasks. And uh, came with the ability to reorder the tasks and in a sense reweight them, do a little more of this this time and a little more of that next time. So for the economists, it's technology that drove up the value of education because what happened was the computer did the repetitive tasks uh, in broad form that left the non-repetitive task to human beings and the service sector grew and became productive with computer technology. And the fact that it's a service job means you interact more and more with other people and that takes more skill than working with a machine all day. And the business explanation then in the end is uh, essentially the same thing from another point of view. The competitive requirements to stay in business changed, producing high volumes of goods or services at the lowest possible cost and therefore the lowest price, producing standardized goods and services was, had become a simple parlor trick could do that in uh, India and in China, uh, almost anywhere in the world now, relatively easily, with low-skilled workers. And in the end, the business people will tell you that that wasn't what mattered so much. What mattered was, in anything that was mass-produced, like computer chips, what mattered was quality, your ability to produce variety, your ability to produce customer service and convenience, your ability to produce something that somehow or other engaged the consumer so that it was customized to the individual. Think about shopping on the internet. Or going, the initial example in the old days always was the ATM machine. You fire the teller and you put the customer to work. What the customer gets out of that is they can go to the ATM machine anytime that they get convenience customization, and arguably quality. Computer's better than a teller. Until you've had somebody steal your, your account number. But anyway, the, um, in the end, it's, it became an entirely different economic system. And in the United States, uh, when everybody said, well, uh, these people need more skill. If you're gonna do quality, you have these fundamental skills, like what's the, what's the ability to do quality? What's the skill? Well. Uh, in the end, it's the ability to take responsibility for the f uh, quality and customer service of the final good or service, even if you just make part of it. The ability to take responsibility. How do you teach that? Uh, in the end, if you're going to do customization, um, you're going to have to have very deep knowledge because you can't just have enough knowledge to do the same thing over and over again. You're constantly mixing uh, what you do, and you've got to have robust knowledge, but not only that, you have to have what we came to call skill, um, uh, and, and when we tried to measure it, uh, things like problem solving skill. If you're going to do customization, every time you do something, it's the first time, sort of, or it's different than the last time. Uh, so you've got to be able to solve problems. You've got to be able to think critically, especially in services. 
So we expanded the scope of skill required and the depth of knowledge required in almost everything. So then when people looked around, or when employers went out to hire, they, and they tried to find this person who had all that, deeper knowledge, more skill, what they learned in their hiring, the employers in the American economy, there are 160 million jobs, uh, we replace all those jobs every three years. We can do a complete turnover in jobs, turn over 30 million a year, 40 million a year. Uh, and then you think of all the promotion decisions and so on. Employers are making hundreds of millions of decisions every few years about people, hiring them, firing them, promoting them. What they learned in that was people with high school degrees couldn't do these jobs. They didn't do a study. Uh, they didn't set up a test. They just knew that when they hired the high school people, they couldn't cut it. So they said, okay, what do we do now? Well, we're not going to start a whole new system to teach these skills. There was a lot of talk then that we ought to become Germany, by the way, that we should have an apprenticeship system. Well, that went nowhere for a lot of reasons. So in the end, what we did is we said, well, we got this what is now a $270 billion per annum investment in what we call post-secondary education. Why don't we use that? Well, nobody actually had this conversation. It just happened. Of course we use that. We're going to build another one. And so higher education took on an employment responsibility that had never really had before. Back in the 70s, about 30% of the workers needed higher ed. Now we're up to 60, 62, 63. Number varies depending on whose data you use, but it's high. And it is not all the same. That is, everybody doesn't need a BA. Uh, what we know now is that after 83, the value of post-secondary went up from 39% wage premium over high school to 84%. But the thing that was even more striking than that was that what you made determined what, what you took determined what you make. That is, when you look underneath that number, 84%, the variation in returns was growing even more rapidly than the returns were rising. So what we found out, that to give you the current way to say this, the rules of the game now between higher ed, or post-secondary education and training, uh, and the economy, the rules of the game are, it does matter how much you get. If you don't know what you're doing, just keep going to school. The odds that it'll pay off are pretty high. On average, a high school graduate or a dropout will make less than a million dollars over a 40-year career. Uh, if, you get, uh, uh, if you get a some college, no degree, no certificate, it'll take you to a million two, a million three. If you get an AA, it'll take you to a million seven. If you get a BA, it takes you to 2.3 million over 40 years. If you get graduate degrees and so on, it can take you all the way up to 3.6, 3.8 uh, million dollars over 40 years. But underneath that, rule number two is what you take determines what you make. So you can get a certificate a one-year certificate in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and you'll make more than 20-25% of the BAs. You can get a two-year degree in engineering, you'll make more than well over half the BAs. BAs, 44% of BA, people with BAs, make more than people with graduate degrees. It all comes back to the a course of study, the career, the education and career pathway. So the system has become, is unbundling itself. Education is now coming in uh, education and career pathways, uh, which is not to say people who could take a liberal arts degree uh, do pretty well, uh, depending on how many years, if you get a four-year liberal arts degree, uh, you'll do okay. Uh, Truthfully, if you get a four-year liberal arts degree, you need to go to graduate school. So there is, a, uh, there is a rough system there. It is also true that in almost any particular field of study, career pathway, college pathway, 
the higher degree beats the lower degree. So yes, uh, if you get a certificate in engineering, which is something that doesn't exist very much, but you'll make more than a lot of uh, most AAs. If you get an AA in engineering, you'll make more than most BAs. And if you get a BA in engineering, you'll make a lot more than an AA in engineering. So within any field, it's good to climb the ladder. But the first thing, the first decision you have to make is which field. And fields are different. Some fields don't have a ladder. It's hard to get from HVAC to engineering, as far as I know. One of the issues with connecting uh, stackable certificates and all the rest of that is trying to figure out what those pathways might look like and if we don't know what they look like to see if we can actually create them. How do you get from HV, HVAC to a two-year degree in engineering? I have a, a clue, by the way, but uh, the, some of their, a lot of these ladders are very, very short, although they have high returns. The returns are different for men and women. There are essentially two labor markets in America. It's one for boys and one for girls. It's still true. So what we see with women that's interesting nowadays is that they get more and more education, more than men. More high school graduates than men, more certificates, more AAs, more four-year degrees, more graduate degrees, now more PhDs, uh, and fairly soon more professional degrees. Actually, they've already done that depending on how you count uh, health care. So if you, uh, but the difference is that at every degree level and within every field of study, women make less and women are segregated in very specific fields. And they tend to be lower earning fields. So if you're a female uh, getting a high school degree, uh, you have to do it, but it won't do you much good. There are no jobs for female high school graduates. There are still jobs for male high school graduates, maybe 20% of them and hopefully more uh, with the, the boom in energy and hopefully what we're seeing is a, a comeback in manufacturing, we may get more. Certainly in energy, maybe not in manufacturing because manufacturing is now certificate or AA level more and more, even on the line. So for women, you don't get traction. Certificates for women aren't very good. Uh, male certificates, which tend to be technical, uh, pay very well. So the male ladder has a rung in high school, a rung in certificates, uh, a rung in industry-based certifications where they tend to be dominant except for healthcare, uh, and then it has many rungs at the BA level and the graduate level. Women have, the, so the bottom three rungs are kind of missing. Really should start at the AAA for females. Or we should integrate occupations. That's the other way to do this. Is to, I mean, one of the rules for women is if you go into a classroom and everybody in there is female, get out. It's a clue. So in the end, it is a very highly textured and different system. And we've come to the point where we rely on higher education, post-secondary education and training, uh, to make uh, uh, people whole. That is, to give people a shot at the American middle class. And that is a difficult struggle. And it's not just financial, although there's no money. In the midst of trying to do all this, there's no money. I mean, the good news is you are all very important people now. The bad news is we're not going to pay you. Uh, it often happens that way, I find. Uh, so in the end, uh, this transition will be done in the midst of scarcity, which is troublesome and probably not, probably counterproductive. I don't know when we look at, let's take any standard, let's say, uh, let's use the uh, present standard and say if we're going to be number one in the world, in 1992 we were number one in the world in post-secondary education uh, by a lot. We're now 10th uh, uh, or so on BAs and on sub-baccalaureate education compared to other developed countries, we're 17th. That's really always been the weakness in our system, the stuff that goes on between the BA and high school. <laughs>
We just don't do that. We used to do it with employers. That is, the employers used to fill that space. They don't anymore. It's not that they don't train people, by the way, because they do. Employers spend about $140 billion a year in formal training in the United States. The higher ed system is about $270 billion, to give you kind of a comparison. But in addition to that, economists estimate that in the workplace, we do about $300 billion more dollars a year in informal training. So it's a $450 billion system. It's bigger than higher ed. They didn't stop training. The more skilled the worker or an employer gets, the more they train. That's the rule of thumb. Uh, what they did stop doing was hiring people with high school degrees or less. In order to get in the door to get that training on the job and access to technology, you now need some post-secondary except for a small share of males who can still make it out of high school. So uh, in the end, we rely on this system in an environment of scarcity. We're asking it to do something that we can't afford uh, if we're going to meet, if we're going to be number one in the world again like we were in 1992, even the minimum estimates suggest that will require another 150 to 200 billion dollars. We don't have another 150 to 200 billion dollars to spend on higher ed. Truth is, if you look at a 13 trillion dollar GDP, which is what we've got in the United States, that's chump change. But when you add everything up and divide by five and figure out what we need for military and consumption and uh, for the retirement of old people, which is really where the drain is now, especially Medicare. Uh, when you figure all that out, there's not 140 to $200 billion left over to put in higher education. Could be, but doesn't look like anybody's in the mood to do that. So uh, in the end, we do this in an environment of scarcity, and there's an even deeper problem, which is that it's a cultural clash. We have in a very short space of time, really since the 80s and the 90s, uh, decided to use higher education as our workforce development system. We have no other institution to turn to. It's the way we do it here. But higher education uh, doesn't see itself that way, and rightly so. Higher education serves lots of functions. In the end, uh, its principal job, especially, especially higher ed, it's true of all education, but more so, I think, once you get past high school, we've always seen higher ed as a place where people go to develop themselves, explore. <coughs> in the end, we want it to develop people so that they can live more fully in their time, be good citizens. But in the American case, the dilemma is, and in the case of most of the world now, we live in market economies and <coughs> Uh, it's very hard to live fully in your time if you can't get a job and you're living under a bridge. So the employability mission, the workforce development mission in higher education is in the end inseparable from all its other missions. Because people who can't find work don't tend to make good citizens, don't tend to build strong families, don't tend to be productive members of the community, and in the worst cases, if they go several generations with no work, they become a threat to the mainstream culture and economy and the civil society in general. So there is a, a dilemma here. Uh, the forces uh, that are pushing the hardest are to switch the system more so towards uh, economic purposes. And once that starts, it's very hard to stop it. Once something has economic value, it's very hard uh, to not treat it as capital. Once skill and education became human capital, it was doomed to this. It's part of the economy now, and it will be driven in part by the rules that drive market economies. Either we do that proactively and figure out what we want to do and how we want to allocate the resources between the different missions of higher education, or it will be done for us by the market. That is, more and more uh, higher education will be forced to provide uh, what in the worst cases is job, job training uh, from the higher ed point of view. So that I think is the dilemma you confront. All in all, in closing, let me say that this is probably a, uh, it's been a horrible time to talk about this or do this for several years now because of the recession, but it looks like the recession is over. Um, 
It looks like we have a recovery, uh, if we can keep it. Uh, it looks like uh, uh, if we continue on this growth path, very slow, uh, but over the next decade or so, we'll probably create another uh, 20, 22 million new jobs in the United States. Um, for those of you who are young and have not seen growth, I can tell you it's very different than what you've been living through. Um, 22 million new jobs. Uh, the other piece of that, though, is given the baby boom retirement that's beginning in earnest now, uh, we'll get another 23 million jobs from baby boom retirement. That is, we'll have jobs to replace retired baby boomers. Gives us about 55 million jobs total over the decade, notwithstanding calamity. Uh, and uh, many of those, out of the 55, about 37 million will require some kind of post-secondary education or training, it looks like. Uh, and those are fairly distributed in fairly, uh, fairly clear ways between different levels of education and training beyond high school. And the wage returns, while we can never predict those, uh, there's no reason to believe that the wage returns for post-secondary uh, will fall off dramatically relative to the wage returns uh, for high school. Uh, so we do this going forward in better times than we've been doing it for the last uh, almost five, six years now when it's been a very difficult time to do any of this uh, because in part the value of higher education and the jobs available uh, were diminishing over that time. So uh, I think what you do, what you're struggling with uh, is of primary importance, especially in the United States. It largely determines, in the end, uh, the extent to which people do get a shot at upward mobility and middle class status. Uh, in the end, in a world where you've got to have post-secondary education, uh, or most people do, the vast majority of people do, uh, in order to be uh, uh, move, uh, make the transition from dependency in youth to an independent adulthood and to maintain your independence, education has now become a principal tool for doing that and the principal device by which we distinguish uh, middle class from people from working poor uh, and people with very uh, sporadic job histories. So what you're doing in a lot of ways is uh, trying to uh, complete the handshake in the American dream. Uh, that is to give people a means to move up in life in economic terms uh, and at the same time uh, provide them with sufficient learning that makes them good citizens and uh, ultimately one hopes good people however you define that thank you